Good day and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation of uh, our CubeSat project, DTUSAT2, built at the uh, DTU space and in collaboration with various uh, institutes. My name is uh, René Florent. I work at DTU space and I'm the project manager of this satellite project. And the title of my talk today is Bird Safari from Leo. Leo is an abbreviation for, for Low Earth Orbit, which is a uh, type of satellite orbits. Today I will firstly and uh, well, most importantly talk about the bird, the bird that we are going to look for, hence the name Safari. Um, I will talk a little bit about the mission and, and then the hardware. I won't dwell too much on any technological issues or aspects of this uh, project, so um, you'll have to find that information elsewhere. And then I will end up with some of our preliminary results. So, this is the bird that we are going to look for, we're going to track. It's a European cuckoo. It has been selected by the principal investigator of this project, Kasper Thor from Copenhagen University. The reason that he chose this one is because it's a long migrant uh, species. It travels alone and at night. And then, most importantly perhaps, it's a parasite. It means that it lays its egg in another species' nest and then leaves the egg once it's hatched or once it's laid. Uh, and the egg is then hatched and the chick is raised by foster parents. Once the young uh, and inexperienced cuckoo is ready uh, to leave uh, the foster parents, it will migrate in uh, probably the exact same route as its uh, parents to the western and northern part of Africa. So, I brought you some pictures of these uh, cuckoos being raised by foster parents. You see here that there's a considerable uh, uh, size difference and actually when you see these pictures well to parents that has uh, teenage kids I think they can see uh, resemblance here so what is the experiment then going to be or what we call the mission Kasper Tor has suggested that we take a population of birds from Denmark and split them in two parts one part is deliberately displaced each eastwards, perhaps as far as Moscow or even further, in a closed uh, container such that they are not capable of navigating while they are being displaced. They are both, both populations are then fitted with transmitters such that we can study the migration pattern, and then they are released. Now, we expect that the uh, cuckoos released in Denmark will travel to the wintering quarters following the route that the uh, adult uh, cuckoos follow, even though they're doing it for the first time alone and at night. We do not know, of course, what will happen with the other population. Now, if they navigate much like the early missiles, then they will end up here in the eastern part of Africa, being equally displaced. That means that they travel for a certain distance a certain time. No, a certain uh, direction for a certain time. <clears throat> However, if they're capable of finding the right wintering quarters, then they have a different means of navigation. And I do not believe that at this point Casper has a suggestion of how then they are navigating. But of course that would only lead to further work and further investigations. Here I brought a schematic of a cuckoo bird. Now the biologist has empirically uh, determined that a uh, bird can carry as much as 5% of its body mass without it inflicting on its normal natural behavior. And naturally we want to conduct the exper experiment without inflicting on their uh, normal behavior. <coughs> this means that in order to track cuckoos, we have to reduce the technology of today from the current stage down to approximately 5 grams or less. We will also have to shrink it a little bit because we do not want 
the antenna to reach beyond the tail feather of the birds. So once everything is in the orbit, uh, the satellite is up and running, the transmitters has been uh, strapped to the cuckoo birds, the transmitters will then, on a daily basis, pick up uh, a GPS position, store it, and once the satellite passes overhead, relay that information, which is then stored on board the satellite and transmitted down as the satellite passes over ground, of, uh, over the ground station. This is uh, the specifications for the satellite segment. It's a CubeSat. That means I have brought a uh, the engineering model of DTU Sat 1. Here you can see it. Uh, this is the same format as we're working with you know, on DTU Sat 2. It means it has a size of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters uh, and total allowable mass of uh, 1333 grams. And with two solar cells on each side, it has an average power of roughly 700 milliwatts. The payload, the radio receiver that is uh, sitting on board the satellite, operates in the ISM band at 868 megahertz, and we communicate from ground to the satellite using the L band when we send to the satellite and the S band when it sends down to Earth. That means that we are sending at 1.2 gigahertz and we are receiving on the ground station at 2.4 kilometers. All of these systems have been developed here at the DTU. <coughs> the bird transmitter, well, as I just mentioned, it had uh, a total allowable mass of only five grams. It is actually also to be compared with, uh, or it's comparable with the satellite system because it has a power system, it has a solar cell and a rechargeable battery. It has an onboard computer even though it's very small. It has a radio receiver system for the GPS uh, system, and it has a transmitting system operating on the ISM bank. However, this satellite here, which may seem small, is actually enormous compared to the bird transmitter, because the bird transmitter has a total allowable size of 10 by 10 by 30 cubic square millimeters. Cubic millimeters, sorry. And the total available peak power that we can get from this system is only 200 milliwatts. And actually, that will one transmission will probably do a drain the battery such that it needs uh, time to uh, recharge, and that will actually send the transmitter into sort of an idle mode, where the solar cell is basically just charging the battery, waiting for it to come to a level where it's capable of transmitting again. Because of this, we have tried to make it a little smart. And actually, uh, the transmitter is the most smart, the smartest part of the whole system because it has a GPS receiver. That means it knows where it is at any given time on the globe. It also has a small computer, and in that computer, we will actually uh, code in the orbital parameters of the satellite, so it can calculate whether or not the satellite is overhead for any given time and whether or not it's worthwhile turning on the transmitter and trying to relay the data. Also, the data is stored such that, as I said, it will wake up every day, try to get a GPS fix. It will then compare that GPS fix with the last it has recorded, and if they are significantly different, it will store the new fix. It will then have a stack of fixes, a total of five. So these five stacks, or these five fixes, are stored under the transmitter, and at every given transmit uh, opportunity, it will then relay the current position, number three and number five. That means that all positions stored on the transmitter will be relayed at least three times to the satellite, thereby hopefully increasing the uh, probability of getting all the fixes. You can see here a uh, picture of one of the first uh, finished transmitters weighing in at just below four and a half. Grams. So we have actually managed to create such a compact system. So, some of the results. This is a student project. And here I have tried to uh, sum up how many students have been involved. And today, this is actually a little outdated already. We are touching on 90 students now. And we've awarded roughly 1,200 ECTS points for this project. It is cross-disciplinary, so that means that of course, DTU Space is heavily involved in the project, but also DTU Compute, 
electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, nanotech, and photonics has been involved. And then, last but certainly not least, we are working together with Copenhagen University, the Zoological Museum there, because Kasper Torp, the biologist, is employed by the Copenhagen University. And he, as a biologist, does not know anything about satellites, and on the other hand, we do not know anything about bird behavior or biology, other from what we can read in the newspapers and such. And actually, I think that collaboration has sparked a whole, lot, uh, a whole lot, bunch of uh, new ideas and, um, as you can see, a quite um, remarkable project. So, what will it, where would this take us? This graph here shows number of species on the y-axis and average body mass here on the x-axis. So you can see there are only a few number of bird species weighing in at 10 kilograms and only a few weighing in at 3 grams. This is a logarithmic scale, by the way. Today, with the current technology, we are capable of tracking birds down to a body mass of roughly 440 grams. That means that this population of species here can be studied globally from space. With D2Set2, we will extend that limit down to roughly 110 or maybe even 100 grams. That means that we will actually put in a whole new uh, bunch of species that can be studied. But it's also clear from this graph that there's still a lot of room for improvement. And naturally, CASPA has already asked us if we can do a transmitter weighing only one gram. We have declined so far. So, to sum up, DTUSAT2 is a built-up project. It means that it uh, extends beyond the individual student and beyond any uh, one semester. And it gives the students a hand-on experience working with hardware for real, trying to make it work. And actually, since we have a genuine scientific mission, we are trying to unify the two major goals of the university, namely research and education. So this system will provide a new flat platform for biologists and other researchers to do global studies of bird and bats migrating all over the globe. Thank you. Are there any questions? It's all just crystal clear, yeah? I just want to know how, where, where did the cuckoos end up? Well, if they, follow, short, uh, if they follow their normal migrational pattern, they will end up in the, in the, the western part of Africa, North Africa. Yeah, it's there. It will, they, will, they live somewhere here. <laughs> it's not very easy for, for, for biologists to go and do field studies in this part of Africa, especially not at these times. That's why they want to do the study from space. Any other questions? If not, then I will revert to my work and go meet with my fellow satellite builders. Thank you. <laughs>